Mo, if I could, let me just sort of dive in here. The very first question, then I cut this off from as I'm in my intro in your, in your bio, because I figured you'd be able to uh, sort of take us, take us through this journey a little bit. And if you would take us back to the early 90s, when Gary Keller was leading Keller Williams, and it's my understanding that he approached you on a number of occasions and asked you, pleaded with you to come um, and join Keller Williams and be in a leadership role. And I guess my question for you is, you know, if you can remember, you know, back to then, what were those conversations like? And, and what was it that finally made you decide to say yes? Uh, well, Gary Keller heard about me because prior to me meeting him, I was, I had, I had sold a real estate company to Merrill Lynch Realty back when Merrill Lynch had a real estate division. And because I had a two year non-compete, I um, <clears throat> started a consulting training company. So I had been in Dallas with a friend of mine to do um, a consulting session with the top Century 21 broker in the United States. He was a good friend of mine. And, um, and my friend said, let's go buy this little office called Keller something. She said, I used to be in business with Mike Brody and Dick Dillingham, and uh, my little agent is now the manager of this office called Keller something. So we stopped in and met her, and it was just a sweet little group, a sweet little office, and I walked out never <laughs> dreaming I'd hear of them again. <laughs> And about two weeks later, Gary Keller starts calling me. And uh, it was an interesting time because I was living in Oklahoma at the time. And we uh, had a, a total economic crash in Oklahoma because OPEC ruled the oil industry. And of course, Oklahoma is a part of what we call the oil patch. Where there's, where, where there's so much oil business going on. And so we lost almost everything we had. We lost our savings. We lost our um, investment. It was just a horrible time. The economy crashed as badly as it has crashed during COVID. Except in COVID, the government closed it. Whereas that was truly a crash and it was in the late eighties. And um, so here Gary Keller is calling me, talking to me. He called me about three times a week for a couple of months. And he's telling me what a great opportunity he has. And here I am just broke as a church mice, I mean, you know, I have no money, no money. And I'm telling all my friends, you know what? <clears throat> We're gonna build again, and when we do, it's gonna be bigger and better than ever. And all of my friends rolled their eyes and, you know, said, she's an idiot. <laughs> She's not going to build back bigger and better than ever before. And quite frankly, the first thousand times I said it, I didn't believe it either. But I kept saying it. And one morning I got up and I told my husband, Richard, that we really were going to build back again someday and it would be better than ever. And it was in that moment that I really began to believe it in my head. And to the day, two weeks later, was when Gary Keller first called me. So you see, the first thing that happened is I opened a region. So I did assume a leadership role by opening the first region outside of the state of Texas. 
And we did so good in our region in Oklahoma that he, his consultant told him he needed to step down, hire a CEO, or he was going to ruin his health because he was trying to do everything and it was really having a major effect on his health. And so <clears throat> three years after I opened Oklahoma and at the age of 57, he invites me to consider throwing my hat in the ring uh, to become the first CEO of Keller Williams Realty, meaning outside of Gary. And here I was helping him find a CEO. I was bringing people to the table because I never even considered it. I was running the Oklahoma region. We were having a great deal of success. And I told my husband one day, I said, you're never going to believe this, but Gary Keller asked me to throw my hat in the ring. And Richard said, what did you tell him? And I said, I told him, oh, you know, I don't know how to be a CEO. I, I'll just stay in Oklahoma and build the region. And Richard encouraged me to at least look at it, to at least look through that door, to at least see what the opportunity really was. So I finally said yes to him after he had called a kajillion times. And I had my, I was the first person that Gary Keller ever took through career visioning. We call it the, K, the KPA today. And you asked me, what was it that made me finally say yes? when he asked me to become the CEO, I wanna tell you something. It was that process. I was so impressed with the process, so impressed that that made me interested in really getting serious about possibly saying yes. And I'll never forget my first, um, comprehensive interview with him was over eight hours. <laughs> and I remember when he asked um, me to share the things I had done that I was really proud of, the things I'd done since high school and college that I was really proud of, which is one of our career visioning questions. I looked at him and I said, Gary Keller, how much time do you have? <laughs> because I had a whole lot of stuff I wanted to tell him. Uh, so that was the thing that made me absolutely consider the possibility, Bridget. Wow, great. Thank you. Well, we're glad that you said yes. <laughs> That's for, that's for <laughs> well, sure. Well, I wasn't very and glad that, about the first three years, and now I'm really glad I said yes, but it was really, really hard because the company was really, really struggling, and it had a great big chance of not making it, and I can't begin to tell you how hard it was because we were Keller Who, nobody thought our models and systems would work, and that's why when I replaced myself with um, Mark Willis, you know, I said to Mark, now, honey, don't you screw, screw this up. Don't you mess this up. And then when uh, Chris Heller and uh, John Davis took over, I said the same thing to them because they didn't have to do it when it was really hard. I had a staff of seven. I dehired three of them. And Gary and I didn't even have the money most months to pay ourselves a salary. Uh, it, it was really, really, really tough. <laughs> and so they had it easy compared to what I had. <laughs> wow. Well, just as a side note, I did not, uh, I didn't realize about your Merrill Lynch connection. My, my mother actually also was with Merrill Lynch when they 
when they were and, when they got into real estate there for a period of time. So uh, it was yeah, pretty you know. exciting. They offered to buy our company, uh, the company we had before I ever heard of Keller Williams, and they paid us a lot more for it than what we actually thought it was worth. And then I developed the Oklahoma City area for them. So it was really the good Lord preparing me for the job I had to do in Austin, really. Wow. I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, so something else that uh, you, you sort of shared in, in your story as you were taking us back to the, the 90s and just not only the crisis that you personally probably underwent, but just kind of what was going on in, uh, across the industry. And then obviously your, your sort of early days at, as um, leading this company. Most recently, I learned about you being obviously from Oklahoma that you had waited and waited and waited to build a dream home. Uh, you're frozen, Bridget. Home, right, and awesome. cut out. And and unfortunately, you never got to move in. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, well, no, not really. Um, I don't know why we're having such bad connection. I don't know if it's the. I don't know if the storm is causing us to have bad connection. Yeah, it might be. Who knows? Um, well, but I, what I think you said fire. is we wanted to build um, a dream home. Now, remember, I grew up in poverty. Uh, I was what they called Oklahoma poor. I was really, really poor. And uh, I got sick of being poor as a kid. And I vowed to myself that when I grew up, I was going to be anything but poor because I was tired of not having any money and worrying about having shoes without holes in the bottom and all of that. So, um, <clears throat> After Keller Williams began to do well, and we, I finally got some, got some money out of the company because remember, Gary made me his partner. So the owners of Keller Williams Realty International, Gary owns the majority of the stock. I have a nice chunk of the stock and Joe Williams has the little bitty piece of the stock. And so um, when I finally got some money, one of my dreams of my whole life was to build a home where the varmints didn't come in and the snakes didn't come in and the snow didn't come in and the rain didn't come in. So we decided, um, of course, we, we saved up for it. We tried to financially secure our family before we even thought about that. So we were hoping to move in at the age of 70. So we built this home in Oklahoma because that's where our kids and our grandkids are. And, you know, by then, Mark Willis was um, a CEO of the company and I didn't have to be in Austin every single day. I'm there a lot, but I'm not there every day. After all, I'm 83, so I don't have to be there every single day. Gary said I'd hurt, I had earned the right. So we built this beautiful, beautiful home. At least it's beautiful to me. Just, it's just, you know, to see a dream come true is just the most exciting thing in the world. And two months before we got ready to move in, the home burned down. And that was really, really sad to me because all my friends were saying, you're crazy to be 70 years old and you're building this, this big home. Everybody's downsizing at 70. And I kept saying, but you don't understand, this is a dream. You don't get it. I want this dream to become a reality. So here the house burns down. And we had to scrape the lot and start all over because it literally burned down. <clears throat> 
So we made the decision to rebuild. And I'm sitting in that in this house right now. And every day I get up and every day I, I just think I can't believe I'm living here, you know, because I never had anything like this growing up. So I'm so grateful that that dream of having a home. We moved in at age 73 and we've been here a little over 10 years. So wow. they're going to carry me out of this house. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and then of course I, we have a home in Austin and, and it's a lovely little modest home. And, um, and I go there you know, a lot, not during COVID so much, but, but when COVID isn't around, I go there a lot. So that's the story of the house. I have this, the full story in my book. So if you all don't have my book in your office, you need to get it. Uh, yes, that's a, well, that's, story. A great, um, that's a great little segue there because I have a picture of um, of your book. So if for those of you that haven't um, seen um, or read Mo's book, it's a wonderful book. Um, it's called A Joy-Filled Life. And it's it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful book and um, it just has really wonderful life lessons in it. So thank you for um, for writing that and uh, and sharing that. And um, I'm gonna come back to I'm gonna come back to that question. Uh, but before I do I think that uh, I would say, and this is maybe just an assumption, but given what you shared about your upbringing and your background, it would seem to me that that probably is why culture and philanthropy is so important to you. And to me, that is what I think of, when I think of Keller Williams, Keller Williams culture, I think of Mo Anderson and leading our inspirational morning each year at family reunion. Can you share with us, why is that so important to you? Well, uh, in growing up, we could never give anybody a present. We, we couldn't donate money to anything because we were, you know, Oklahoma white trash. That's what I was called sometimes as a child. And I, and I used to think, you just wait till I grow up. <laughs> I'm not going to be white trash. <laughs> um, so um, it, it was amazing because my father had this spirit of giving, but he had no money to give. He was a tenant farmer. And she's doing basically the same thing she wrote a book. Uh, he was a tenant farmer and he had no money. So he would give of his time. And he um, would be the first person to go help a neighboring farmer if he became ill. He was the first person there if somebody had a death in the family to see if there were chores he could do for them. So see, I grew up learning about giving, even though my father had no money to give, he gave of his time. And he was so respected in the community, really, because he was the first one there when anything happened. And then um, I would say the other thing is when I, this, this is in my book, but when, when I was probably, um, I don't know, in fifth grade or fourth grade, I, I can't remember for sure. <clears throat> uh, we were in our pitiful old car and we were in a town called Enid, Oklahoma, when my father took me by the Carnegie Library. And that's where we would check out books because we certainly couldn't afford books. And he walked me up the steps to that old beautiful library and he said, I wanna tell you the story about Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie grew up poor like we are, 
But when he got older, he um, did well. And then he made a fortune in the steel industry. He was a controversial figure, uh, I guess, politically some way. But my father told me his story. And at the end of the story, he looked at me and he said, I just think this is amazing because he had an eighth grade education and yet he told me this and it affected my life in a profound way. He looked at me and he said, I always want you to respect the rich because they usually give back. And in that moment, he did two things for me. Number one, he was really telling me that it was okay to make money. Because see, when you grow up in poverty, you have these crazy weird ideas about money. Oh, I don't deserve it. Oh my goodness, I got a big commission and I really don't deserve it. You have these inner thoughts that you're not worthy and you don't deserve it. And we've got hundreds and hundreds of agents in Keller Williams who still are battling with that little voice in your mind that says, I'm not worthy. You know, I don't want to be rich like those filthy rich people. I don't want to be that. Well, baloney, be as rich as you can be because that means you have more money to give away. And then he also, in that moment, not only let me know it was okay to make money, he also let me know that if I did, I had a responsibility to give it away. My husband and I support about 43 ministries and charities. In addition to that, we support KW Cares, KW Kids Can, and Red Day which are huge, you know, for me. So I'm so grateful to him uh, for two things, to my father, because number one, he made me work as a kid. And of course that's easier to do when you live on a farm because the work on a farm never ends. And it's much harder to build a work ethic in a child when you live in town because you, there aren't as many things to do. I'm even glad now that I grew up in poverty because it makes me so grateful for every little thing I have. You know, when I get a new pair of shoes, I get excited still. And I'm 83. <clears throat> so I, I'm now that I can connect the dots, I'm grateful, really grateful that I grew up in poverty because I learned a work ethic that helped me succeed at Keller Williams Realty. And then I, Gary gave me an opportunity and now I've been blessed and now I can bless other people. We had an agent in one of the offices that I used to be the OP and I felt like it was time for somebody else to learn how to do that. So I stepped down and put someone else in, but he's gay. And he, about three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, he was coming home to park his car in his designated space at his apartment complex. He is the sweetest, most lovable. Uh, the agents in that market center just love him. And there was a car parked in front of him and he got out of his car and he, he pounded on their window and he asked him if they would be, if they'd move up just a little bit more so he could get in his parking space. They jumped out of the car. They recognized, I, I think, that he was gay. And they beat the tar out of him. It was horrible, horrible, because he's gay. He didn't even know these people. And um, it was just tragic. 
Well, see, I was able, I knew that he would have medical bills. I knew that he had insurance, but I also knew he had a pretty big deductible. Well, see, I was able to write him a check. And if I hadn't accumulated wealth, if I hadn't gotten over all my silly thoughts about, well, I can't take a big commission check because I'm not worthy and all that mess. If I hadn't fought to get over that and my father hadn't taught me what he did about giving and about the importance of making money so that you can give. See, I wouldn't have been able to write Christian a check. And Christian is just one of the sweetest people in the world. And I was able to help him. Do you get my point? So if any of you who are listening in, you've fought these battles because maybe you didn't grow up with a silver spoon in your mouth, I'm telling you, you can get over it. It took me years to get over it, but I'm over it. <laughs> And in, in the joy of giving to other people is just the, and being able to actually give money because you can give your time and that is wonderful, but you can get more done if you can also give your money. So I want you all rich because I want you giving and giving and giving. It's just, it's just great, you know, when you see someone that needs something and you can help. Oh, man, that's the greatest joy in my life outside of my family. Did I answer that okay? <laughs> you did, and then some. Yeah, and, uh, and you'll be pleased. My 16-year-old my, my has been working with us um, this summer as an intern. So he's, uh, that's my 16-year-old. So he's Hi, been working with name? us this summer. So he is, uh, he's listening. His name is Anderson, so he's been, he's been listening and, and hearing some of your great words of the so. Good. So, thank you. Um, okay, so let me ask you um, another question. Uh, there are a lot of tools, many I'm sure you were largely responsible for within our company. What would you say is the most underutilized tool item that exists within Keller Williams? Profit sharing. Profit sharing. And it's the greatest gift that Tell me more. Can, give, can give each of us. But it's profit sharing. It's so exciting to me to see the agents who get it and they really go to work to build their their downline so that they can have what we call passive income. Um, and, and let me tell you how important passive income is. Right now, because of COVID, a lot of the states on the East Coast and the West Coast and Michigan and Illinois were really pretty closed. I mean, some of them were closed, closed, if you know what I mean. And most of the inner states in the country, uh, not on the borders, but the inside states, they were sort of closed. Do you get my point? Well, the states on the inside of the company are absolutely doing really, really well because they opened earlier and so our royalty income from those states have really helped us survive at the national level. But let me tell you what, California was the major state for us. And, and New York was a major state. I mean, these states were really important. So our income uh, during kind of the peak of COVID went down in those states 95%. Did you get that? So Gary and I cut the budget. Wow. We cut it by 55%. We cut out everything we didn't have to have. And um, so we were financially sound, but in doing so, 
we are not giving ourselves any owner disbursements. Gary and I are not taking one penny out of this company. Well, how do you pay your bills if you don't have a cash, if you don't get cash from somewhere? So see, the way we're paying our bills and we aren't getting any income from the company, we probably won't for two years because we've got to rebuild the reserve account. We spent most of the reserve account on tech is what we did. And we thought we had another year of good business that we'd be able to build that reserve account back up. Well, COVID shows up. So, you know, I don't know what we would do if we didn't have passive income. Are you with me? Yes. So COVID is a great example of you better get serious about passive income because crazy things, I mean, this whole mess has just been mind boggling. It's, it's crazy. All of our freedoms, you know, you couldn't go to the movie on Saturday night. You had to stay home. You, all the free, you know, the things that we're used to doing, we don't get to do anymore. And we have to be so careful about being with each other and all that stuff. So passive income is a critical factor in your life. And it is so easy to get if you understand that all you have to do is to tell the people that you do transactions with if you like them. Now, if they're little prima donnas and you can't stand them and you, you, know, you, you don't want them around, don't say this to them. But if they're people that you respect <laughs> and you like, you simply say, you know what? I love doing deals with you. you. The last deal we did, you jumped through hoops to make it work. And I was telling Bridget how great you are. And as a favor to me, I want you to meet Bridget. I know you're happy as a clam. Someday you might not be. I just want you to know who Bridget is. That's all. Now, if you think she's going to recruit you off the bat, you're wrong. She's not. She's probably going to give you a gift because I like doing business with you. And then, of course, Bridget, when she has her initial meeting with him, can give him the red book or the blue book or my book or whatever book she feels is appropriate for that person. That's how you do it. That's all in the world you say. I just want you to meet Bridget. I know you're happy. I'm not trying to recruit you. I just want you to know who she is. And then she takes it from there. <clears throat> now, is that hard? Somebody answer me. Let me see if you put it in the chat room. Uh, it's that simple. And then see, over, over time, that passive income grows and grows and grows. It's shocking how much it grows. It doesn't take long. No, it doesn't. It doesn't take long. So, Bridget, when sure. you select your ALC. Well, I had a feeling you were probably going to. Promise me you will not choose them if they don't have at least one person in their downline. Because if, if they have nobody in their downline that tells you and me they are not interested in passive income. And we want people on ALC who are passionate about passive income because when people see their passion, then they'll start to get interested in it. Are you with me, Bridget? Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and some, of, some great news um, for you to hear. Our ALC uh, is masterful because um, 
they're all really, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of great agents in our, in our company and members of our ALC are, are no exception. And I've had several occasions where some of our ALC members have been somewhat solicited by others and they have been very masterful at flipping the table on them and talking to them instead about what it could actually mean for them to be here at Keller Williams. So uh, it's, uh, it's well, really we're, worked, we're uh, it's worked out very well. Rebecca Ward says, it's, it's not hard, guys. It's fun. And it really is. And you know what? They love it so much because you're saying something kind and nice to them because they don't get that very often from other realtors. So it's that simple. What else do you want to know, Bridget? Um, so uh, one, of our, one of our actual ALC members, he's, he's on the call, and I might have him actually just sort of expand on it. Um, he could uh, maybe unmute himself, Frank Sirio. He is our, he is our team leader here for the, for, uh, for the Bob Lucido expansion team here at the beach. I guess apparently you had spoken with the Lucido team not too long ago, and I think Frank was maybe hopeful that you might share uh, some of what you all talked about on that on that call. Frank, if you're on, can you unmute yeah, yourself uh, and maybe ask? I think I'm on. Uh, actually, yeah. I can probably put the video on as well. Um, Mo, when we were talking and, and, and our team really enjoyed uh, having you on the call um, and, and guiding us through, but one of the things that uh, we, we found very important was many teams were talking about altering their business plan because of the interruption of COVID. And I, and I don't know if you recall, but one of the things that we talked about was we're moving on just as we had planned for 2020, that we weren't altering our plan, that we saw this as an opportunity to still grow and that our business plan was maintaining. And you had some good words of wisdom and, um, and we're sharing some thoughts about why we should maintain our business plan. I don't know if you recall the conversation, but um, it was a couple months ago. Uh, well, let me tell you what, there's never been a greater opportunity than now to build your business. And the ones who are willing to get up off of the couch absolutely are killing it. I am amazed at what everybody's doing because you see command is good enough at this point that you can do all sorts of stuff by computer and you don't have to go anywhere. And then you can show properties by virtual tours. And I am amazed and shocked at how beautifully the people who get it and are off of the couch, how well they're working their sphere of influence, the calls they're making every day. They did the love calls at first. You know, what do you need? What can I bring and put on your porch? And now they're getting into the depth with this. Like, uh, who do you know that needs to refinance their house? Who do you know that needs to move up? Because you see, there are a lot of people out there with money and they want to move up. And now's not a better time in the whole wide world to move up because the interest rates are so low. And then there are a jillion people out there who need to move down because they, maybe one of them lost their job in COVID. And this is the greatest time in real estate in my 83 years to build a real estate business but you got to get up off of the sofa to do it and so <clears throat> we've got a bunch of sofa setters in our company but we have a lot of great agents who are up and moving and shaking it and doing really really well i'm just shocked do you know that in Oklahoma, of all places, I want you to know that we have beat our best years so far in the whole industry has been during COVID. I couldn't believe it because here we were all, you know, cutting our costs and really worried. They have, these agents here have more business than they know what to do with. And yet we've got the couch sitters. Now, can I, Bridget, where, 
can I go another direction real quick? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me let me talk sure. to Certainly. you for a minute about the couch sitters. We all have couch sitters because we didn't recruit properly on the front end because there are three things that a brand new, and I'm talking about brand new agents because experienced agents, uh, they do some level of business and many of them can do much more if they have great training. But, <clears throat> but I want to tell you the three things that a person has to be a match for in order for them not to be a couch sitter. Are you with me? So when you guys bring referrals yes. to Bridget, you've got to make sure before you ever bring them in, uh, to her that they understand what they have to match in order to be a part of us. Number one is the Y4C2Ts and our value statement, God, family, and business. If they're turned off by the Y4C2Ts or by our value statement, and we all know that God, family, and business simply means whatever your faith is, you put that in your family first and the business second. And then the Y4C2Ts is how we agree to treat each other. Win, win, or no deal. Integrity, do the right thing. Uh, trust begins with honesty, et cetera, et cetera. And if, if they just kind of turn their nose up at that and they, they just don't even, you all, they're not a cultural match. And if you bring them on when they hate that kind of stuff, they'll eventually leave. <clears throat> the second thing they have to be um, a match for is technology. And if they're not, you know, if they go, oh, I can't learn that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm 40 years old and I've never been around it and I, I just can't do that. Well, <clears throat> you know that if you take them, they're going to have to hire an assistant really fast who knows technology, you know, who will do it for them. But here's the big one. You need to talk to them about lead generation because when you get in the real estate business, you're really not in the real estate business. What you're in is in a lead generation business. And your sphere of influence is the most precious commodity that you have when you're a realtor. And, and you've got to be willing to learn those scripts and dialogues and learn from the agents who are so good at this. Uh, I, I can recall a long time ago, I did a thing in Houston it, because team leaders were spending like an hour with the new recruit in, um, and they needed to be spending an hour with an experienced agent. So <clears throat> I said, I want to show you how to do it. So we had some team leaders in the room and they had um, a guy coming, the team leader of that market center had a guy coming at three o'clock. Well, he comes, I meet him at the door and I say, I'm so excited to meet you. I get to be the one that asks you the magical question today. And I'm just thrilled to meet you. Come on in. I do want you to know that we have only one opening for a new person. He, he was brand new to the business. One opening, and you do, you only have one opening at a time. And I said, <clears throat> I want you to know I'm gonna be interviewing at least five to 10 people for that one spot. And I'm gonna choose the person that I believe has the greatest chance to succeed. Now, are you okay with that? And he said, yes. 
And I said, this could be a short meeting or it could be a long meeting. I don't know which it will be until we get into it. So he came on in, he sat down, we got him his coffee or whatever he had. And I leaned over and I said, what have you done since high school or college that you are really proud of? And he begins to fold his arms and he says to himself, what have I done that I'm proud of since high school or college? Let me think. And he crosses his legs and he leans back in the chair. And I can only stand 45 seconds of silence when I ask that question. Really, I can only stand about 30 seconds of silence. And I always wear a watch when I interview someone that has a, a second hand on it. So the 45 seconds were up and I grabbed his hand and I said, it has been wonderful meeting you. And if I decide I want to talk to you again, I'll give you a call. And I had him out of that office in five minutes. And I looked at my team leaders I was working with and I said, he can go fail at somebody else's office. <laughs> now, I happen to be a Christian and I'm going to say this, not to be disrespectful, but I think Jesus himself could have been there. And he would have still twisted his legs and folded his arms and said to himself, let me think, let me think. Studies have been done, especially at Texas A&M. And if a person does not have a track record of success, they have a 90 to 95% chance of failure in sales. Do you hear that? We got to quit setting them up for failure. So at four o'clock, they had a gal coming in and she was brand new and she had decided she wanted to maybe pursue real estate. So I give her the same talk. We only have one opening. I've already interviewed one person for the spot and I'll be interviewing several more and I'll choose the one that I think has the best chance of succeeding. And she comes in, we give her her coffee and I don't talk about the weather, I don't talk about anything. I just say to her, <clears throat> what have you done since high school and college that you're proud of? And she, she slides to the edge of her chair, she leans over, her face gets animated, and she says, I was president of my sorority in college. I want you to know I organized the spring sing. I want you to know that we won the whatever it was. She rattles on and on and on about all the stuff she's done. She says, I married my husband, we moved to Houston. I'm president of some club. We won a contest. We got to go to the White House, you know, as a result of this contest. And I want you to know that I organized this and I've done that. And I'm sitting there listening to every word of it going, thank you, I've got me a prospect. <laughs> because see, she had a track record. She capped in four months and she was the rookie of the year for Houston that, that year. That's what we're looking for. Now, occasionally, you know, you might send somebody down the street that maybe could make it with hours and hours of help. I don't know. And a lot of agents say to me, well, Mo, what about the, what about the mother that's been a great mother and helped her husband and she's just wonderful and she has wonderful children? Well, the greatest success in life is being a parent. But I want you to put being a parent aside. And I want you to look at that person and say to yourself, I'm going to listen to what she's done outside the home. Did the mother maybe 
uh, organized the Girl Scouts. Maybe, maybe the mother was president of the PTA. Are you with me? Because you're looking for two things. You're looking for initiative, where they get off the couch. And you're looking for discipline, where they are disciplined enough that every single week they make their calls. And then if, if you will bring, Bridget, these kind of people that have a track record, then you're not going to have couch sitters in your office anymore. But Bridget gets so excited when you bring her somebody that she breaks her neck to take them, you know, to help you build your downline. But you got to be careful who you're bringing her. Did y'all get that? We got it. Do you we got it. Thank I'm you. Saying? That's great. Okay. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so earlier, you, you mentioned, you shared uh, about your book, uh, A Joy-Filled Life, and I'd love to maybe just come back to that for a second, as I, I mentioned earlier that I was going to come back to that. So I've read the book. I'm not sure who else on, on the call has read the book. What inspired you to, to write it? And obviously now you're, you're like on this national or maybe even potentially international speaking tour. Um, what was it that kind of drove you to write the book? And Kind of what, I, what actually, has come of I actually wrote it as uh, to leave a legacy for my three grandchildren. And we're going to have our first great grandchild in September. So I really wrote it as a legacy for my kids and grandkids. And quite frankly, I didn't think anybody would want to read it, but I thought they would. And uh, now, 45,000 books later, a lot of people have wanted to read it. Uh, some team leaders use it in their book club, in their market centers. It's, um, there's a mother, uh, one of our agents, she's a mom. She's using it with a group of teenagers in a, some kind of a weekly meeting they have. It's just fascinating to me how it kind of caught on and it and people are using it so i just hope it it i just hope it was a blessing to you when you read it bridget and um and that's why i wrote it <laughs> i didn't think it would anybody would want it see that bad thinking that stinking thinking that we have in our heads or at least i have on occasion Are you there, Bridget? I lost Bridget. Can you all can you all see her and I, hear her? I don't. I think we might have lost her. Um, okay. Let me see. She wanted me to continue asking the questions. Let me see if I can pull them up. Well, we've got two minutes left, I think. Um. Well, maybe we'd like last words from you, Mo, until she comes back. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, um, I'm just so proud of you all because um, I know that the couch sitters probably aren't on this call. And, and I'm so proud of you because you're moving forward in spite of all the things that are against you in in shutting in with COVID shutting us down and there's still a way to do the business and uh, if I had time today I I would go into the what I learned from Gary Keller about mindset but we're out of time and I can't do that so if you ever want to do this again well, just call my gal, Kelly, and we'll set up Absolutely. another call and remind me that's what you want me to talk about. Uh, because, you know, everything in life has to do with, with how you think inside as to whether or not you'll do it. But I just want to tell you that I really love you. I care about you. I just want you to succeed at the highest level. I want you to make a lot of money. 
because I want you to learn the joy of giving it away to people who need it. And, uh, and I just want you to have a great rest of the year because wherever you are in your business, you still have quite a bit of time to achieve and reach your goal. And that's what it's all about is the reaching is to reach the goal that we have. Amy, give me a big smile. There it is. Okay, I, Bo, uh, Bonnie, you've been great. Rebecca, it's been so fun to get to talk to you. And um, so I got to get off and take my next right. call. Thank you Thank so you much, much Mom. Mom. Appreciate okay. it. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you very much. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. If you want to do it again, just call Kelly. We definitely want to do it again. <laughs>